What a wonderful day it has been for Janice and me to be here at Lafayette, to be with you good brothers and sisters, and to be welcomed uh, in a way that could not have been more warm and friendly, and it has been a great encouragement to us to be with you, and we simply look forward to these remaining days and more of the food that we had today at lunch, I tell you. I don't know. Uh, I told uh, someone today I have a physical Thursday morning for an uh, insurance policy, and I may fail miserably. I, <laughs> they may tell me I have six months to live after, I, <laughs> after consuming all this good food, but no, surely not. It, uh, it is great. We appreciate it so much, and I certainly echo what David said in his expression of appreciation to the ladies and any men who cooked and prepared the wonderful food today and the fellowship has been precious indeed for us, I guarantee you. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but by the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Those inspired words from Peter's pen in 1 Peter 1, 18 through 20 affirm that the sacrifice for our sins was planned, as we talked about in the Bible class this morning. We also said that the church was planned by God as the spiritual body for which Christ would shed his blood to purchase that body for himself. And Acts 20, verse 28, Paul's admonition to those elders at Ephesus, had he call, as he called them to him at Miletus, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. And what about Paul's statement? Paul's statement in Ephesians 3, 9 through 11. Go back to verse 8 to gain the context more fully. To me who I am less than the least of all saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ to the intent that now to the principalities and powers in heavenly places listen to it, might be made known by the church his manifold wisdom, might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. The manifold wisdom of God is now to be made known by the church. That's what Peter is, uh, or Paul is saying, absolutely. In other words, Paul is saying the culmination of this plan that began so long ago is the church of Christ. Not a denomination by that name, but a pre-denominational body. And by that I mean one that existed, the church that existed before any denomination ever came into existence. We finish that text with verse 11. According to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so, as we have already pointed out this morning in Bible class, the church was not a last-minute change in God's plan, nor was it something that was optional for one to join after salvation. The church is essential to salvation, and only those who are in the church will be saved. Now, with that being said, and it's abundantly clear that the Scripture teaches that, does that church exist today? Well, of course it does. If it didn't, there'd be no possibility of one's being saved. Daniel's prophecy, one at which we looked this morning along with Isaiah 2, 1 through 4, Daniel's prophecy said that in the days of the Roman kings, the God of heaven would set up a kingdom which would what? Never be destroyed. That it would break in pieces all other kingdoms and that it would last forever. We clearly established this morning that that kingdom is the church. The church is the kingdom. Daniel's prophecy said it will never be destroyed, therefore it exists and will continue to exist for as long as time stands. 
The church is essential to salvation. One cannot be saved without being in the church. You think about a few passages in Ephesians. Again, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. And he put all things, he, God, put all things under his, Christ's feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. The church, which is his body. You go over to Ephesians 4 and verse 4, and you see there is one body. Among those great seven ones that are enumerated there by the Apostle Paul, he says there is one body. He's already identified that body as being the church, therefore there is one church. But again, not the best denomination among all the denominations. We're not talking about denominationalism in any positive sense whatsoever. Because frankly, there's nothing positive about denominationalism. The theme of this gospel meeting is that it is sinful to array, align oneself rather, with a religious institution that does not have as its founder the Christ, does not have as its organization that which is clearly set forth in the New Testament, does not have all of the aspects of the church of the New Testament about which we can read and which we must emulate today in order to be that church of the first century in the 21st century today. Can we be the church of the first century in the 21st century? Absolutely we can and must. And all that is necessary is for us to identify that pattern, to identify that church of the first century and emulate that pattern. The church is essential to salvation. There's one other passage I want to look at before we move on in Ephesians chapter 2 as a part of the Ephesian passages that relate to the church. And that is the relationship of the cross to the church. Because there have been very prominent denominational preachers who would separate the cross from the church, if you will. In other words, they would say, you must come to the cross. You must kneel at the cross, as it were, and as they put it, they mean literally kneel at the cross from the standpoint of the sinner's prayer as their concept of what it means to be saved. That is, to invite Jesus into your heart as, if, as your personal Savior, to pray the so-called sinner's prayer, about which we'll say more as time goes on in this meeting. But there is nothing in Scripture about salvation through the praying of a prayer. In fact, there's everything in Scripture that clearly contradicts salvation through the praying of a prayer. What did Saul of Tarsus do? After the Lord appeared to him on the Damascus road and he realized it was the Lord he had seen and who was speaking to him and he said, Lord, what will you have me to do? Go into the city of Damascus and there it will be told you what you must do. He sent Ananias, a certain disciple, to him and when he arrived there he said, why are you waiting? What was he doing as he waited? We go back to Acts 9, 11, and we find out what he was doing because when Jesus told Ananias to go to him, he said, behold, he is praying. Saul of Tarsus was doing the only thing he knew to do at the time as he waited for someone to tell him more. He was praying. He was doing the very thing that the vast majority of the denominational world tonight tells you you must do to be saved, and yet it would not save Saul of Tarsus. And it did not save Saul of Tarsus. Because when Ananias arrived, he said, Why are you waiting? Or why tarriest thou, as the King James says? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. That's a participle that indicates that's the process by which you will call on the name of the Lord by getting up and being baptized. Not by calling on the name of the Lord by praying a prayer, calling on the name of the Lord by obeying, not praying. And that's what allowed Saul of Tarsus to be added to the Lord's church. So are the cross and the church inseparable? Absolutely. Listen to Ephesians 2, 14 through 16. There the Apostle Paul writes, For he himself is our peace, who has made both one. Who's he talking about? Jew and Gentile. Whom does that leave out? No one. You're either a Jew or a Gentile. Everyone in here is either a Jew or a Gentile, and I dare say, if I had to guess, you're all Gentiles, most likely. But you're one or the other, because that's what everybody is in one of those two categories. So, he himself is our peace who has made both one, 
and has broken down the middle wall of division between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, what is it, Paul? The law of commandments, the old law, contained in ordinances so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. Now verse 16, and that he might reconcile them both, Jew and Gentile, reconcile them both to God, how? In one body. But then he adds, through the cross, through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. How can you separate the cross and the terms that Jesus set forth from Calvary that one must do to become his disciple? How do you separate that cross from the church? You don't. Because the Apostle Paul, by inspiration, again said that what? He might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross. That's equivalent to saying that he purchased the church with his blood that he shed on the cross. That's exactly what he's saying. Back to what Paul told those Ephesian elders. The church which he purchased with his own blood. When he died on the cross, he died to purchase the church. Well, no wonder Paul would say the manifold wisdom of God is made known now by the church. It was the church God had in mind all along, long before the tabernacle was ever built, long before the temple was ever constructed by Solomon. God knew that ultimately his manifold wisdom would be made known by the church. Here's the question. How do I find the Lord's church? If it still exists, how do I find it among all the religious groups in existence today. And another question is, does it matter that I find it? Does it make any difference whether I find it or not? Is one just as good as another? Well, prominent denominational preachers have brought people by the thousands to the altar, so to speak, to pray the sinner's prayer and then have told them what? Now you go, you're saved now, which they were not. Now you go and find you a church with which you are comfortable. Just pick one that suits you. That's what they've been told to do over the years. Is one just as good as another? The answer is clearly no. But to know the answer to these questions we've just asked, we have to answer or ask another question. What is... The church, as the scriptures define, the church that exists this very night. First of all, think with me about what the church is not. The church is not a building, and it was never called such in the New Testament. There's a statement made in Acts 11, verse 22. Then news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem. And they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. The news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem. Does a building have ears? No. This building doesn't have ears. So when the scripture says that the news of these things came to the ears of the church, the church is obviously a reference to the people, the called out people from the world. And that's what the meaning of church is, those who are called out called out of the world and into Christ, how are they called? By the gospel. Now that's why we really, we really misstate it when we say, well, I'm going to go over to the church, uh, when we mean we're going over to the church building. The church building is not the church. And another thing, the building, this building is not the house of God. This building is not the house of God. The house of God is the people who are Christians. They are the house of God. 1 Timothy 3.15, but if I tarry long or if I'm long delayed, Paul wrote to Timothy that you may know how you ought to behave yourself in the church of God, in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. The house of God, which is the church of the living God. And so, this building is not the house of God. You are, if you're a Christian tonight. 
You're a part of the house of God. In other words, the household of God, the family of God, the brotherhood of Christ. Also, this auditorium is not the sanctuary. There's nothing sanctified about this auditorium. It's a lovely auditorium, very commodious for worship and study of the Bible, but it is not a sanctuary as the denominational world uses that term. And it is not holy ground. The only sense in which this area in which we find ourselves tonight is holy ground is when God's people are here as holy people. <laughs> That's holy ground in the sense, but not literally the building itself, is it? Finally, the church is not the collection of all of the religious groups in the world. And that's the misconception that the denominational world has tonight. The denominational world will tell you, well, yes, we believe that in the church, but all of the, do all of the denominations comprise the church and make up the church, and that's the definition of the church. That is not the New Testament definition of the church. In fact, that concept that I've just described violates the clear teaching of the New Testament. You think about what Jesus prayed for, and later this week, Lord willing, we'll be looking at that prayer in more detail. Can we ever truly be united? In dealing with that subject, we'll do so from an examination of what is truly the Lord's Prayer. You know, many people, if you say, where's the Lord's Prayer, they'll turn to the Gospel of Matthew. But that's the model prayer, really. The Lord's Prayer, the prayer that he prayed, is found in John 17. And in part of that prayer, beginning at verse 20, he says, Neither do I pray for these alone. And the these has reference to the apostles for whom he has just been praying in the verses preceding verse 20. Neither do I pray for these alone, but for all those also who will believe on me through their Word. Notice the emphasis on the word there. Who will believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may be one in us. As I said, we'll talk more about the analysis of the Lord's Prayer later in the week, along with how we can answer it. And it is answerable. <laughs> and it was answered on Pentecost Day. And of course, in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10, the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth about what? About divisions that he had heard about. Through the household of Chloe, he talked about these divisions. Well, where does he mention a, a denomination in there? He doesn't specifically mention a denomination but he, in principle, deals with denominationalism. Think about it. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. Lord prayed for unity, as we've just seen. Paul pleaded for it with the Corinthian brethren. What was the problem? Verse 11 begins to tell us, For it's been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. What contentions, Paul? Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, I am of Christ. And then he asks a rhetorical question. He doesn't seek an answer. He knows the answer. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? Those are all rhetorical questions. He's stating, Paul wasn't crucified for you. Christ is not divided. You were not baptized in the name of Paul. That, in principle, deals with the very problem that faces our world tonight with denominationalism. Because we have those who are saying, I am of Luther. I am of Wesley, I am of the Pope, and on and on you can go. It's interesting, isn't it, and reassuring that the Bible could deal with problems that existed in Paul's day and yet, in principle, anticipate and deal with problems 
in our day today. That's the beauty of Scripture. That's part of the proof of its inspiration. Would Christ pray for something that was impossible to achieve? Or would he give us a command in the New Testament that's impossible for us to obey? Where do you read that it says, I have to fly to Mars in order to be saved? It's not in there. I'm thankful it's not. <laughs> I'm thankful it's not. And I'm not surprised that it's not in there because the Lord would never tell us to do something that we cannot do. Division is sinful. Even if we are all claiming to worship the same God, even if we're all claiming to serve the same Christ, if we are divided, then that is sinful. So what is the church? Keep in mind we're talking about the people, not the building. The church is made up of purified people, first of all. Matthew 1.21 the prediction of the birth of Christ, he, she will bring forth a son and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. In other words, he will purify them. Acts 2.47 of the early church, upon their obedience to the gospel, it says of them, they were praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were what? Being saved. Those who were being saved. 1 Peter 1, 22 and 23, a few verses after the ones we read earlier. Peter writes to Christians and said, Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. The church is made up of purified people. The church is made up of purchased people, as we've already seen from Acts 20, 28. The shepherd, to shepherd the church of God, those elders were told, which he purchased with his own blood. When Jesus instituted, when, inst when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper immediately following his last Passover with the disciples in Matthew 26, 28, he said, for this, referring to the cup, this is the blood of the new covenant. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. For the remission of sins. Ephesians 1, 7, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. And in Revelation 1, 5, Paul, uh, John, as a part of his greeting, says, Greetings, in effect, from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Incidentally, you compare that statement to what Ananias told Saul of Tarsus. To him who loved us, John says, and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Calling on the name of the Lord. Where did Jesus love us and wash us from our sins? In baptism. We'll talk more about that, Lord willing, later in our final lesson of this series. The church is made up of purified people, purchased people, but the church is made up of peculiar people. That is, those who've been set apart from the world. And we have to never lose sight of that peculiarity. Because I'm afraid we live in a time when far too many of God's people are seeking to blend or bend rather than to stand firm, firmly against the division that constitutes the religious world. We live tonight in the most politically correct environment in our lifetime. I don't think there's any question about that. I don't care if you've lived a few years or a lot of years like I have, this has to be the most politically correct environment in which we have ever found ourselves. And the pressures to be politically correct are greater than ever, therefore. And the church is not unaffected by that environment. By that I mean that when you contend for the very thing that these good elders have asked me to contend for in my preaching this week, and that is the exclusivity of the church. 
you are contending for something today that is more repugnant to more people than it has ever been in our lifetime because of the politically correct environment that we find ourselves in. And there are so many people who will say, you are trying to tell me there is but one way to God, that there is but one religious body in which I must find myself or place myself or be added to in order to be saved? How does that comport with the bumper sticker that I've seen on more than one occasion on the back of a vehicle in front of me that said, God is too big for just one religion? Have you ever seen that one? God is too big for just one religion. And under that statement are these various religious symbols representing Islam, representing Judaism, representing the various world religions. That's the environment in which we find ourselves. Oprah Winfrey, and I was not an Oprah Winfrey, uh, Winfrey I can't even say her name. I wasn't even an Oprah Winfrey uh, advocate or devotee of any kinds, but I did see a little bit of her program when it was a regular program, and on one it caught my eye because she was discussing religion, and she made no qualms about saying there are many ways to God, many ways to God. And she had a lot of influence, and still does, I'm sure. And when someone like that, with that kind of influence, that kind of credibility, says there are many ways to God, how does that comport with what Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so what I'm saying is that our peculiarity, our peculiarity as God's people is being tested and tried tonight as it has never been in our lifetime. And we must not capitulate to that pressure. But we must lovingly, lovingly and patiently stand for the truth. You are a chosen generation, Peter reminds you if you're a Christian tonight. A royal priesthood a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And notice how Paul addressed the church at Corinth, to the church of God which is at Corinth, to those who were sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours, 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 2. And so something that's vitally important that we understand and appreciate, and we'll probably repeat it more than once in this series, when we speak of the church of Christ, we do not refer to a denomination. We do not refer to merely a name either for the Lord's church, but to a relationship. The church, the called out people who belong to Christ because they have complied with the teaching of Christ. So this still doesn't help me find the church. To do so, I have to look at what some 3,000 who first became the church did in order to be saved and to remain saved. Here's a pertinent question. Did those who became members of the Lord's church in the first century. Did they do so by following a specific pattern? Then did they follow a specific pattern afterwards? And were they united in one body or did they divide into denominations? Answering these three questions will answer our basic question and that is what is the church? And so let's answer these questions in the remainder of our time tonight about the church of the New Testament. Did those who became members of the Lord's church in the first century do so by following a specific pattern or plan? Indeed, they did. Remember, those who were saved were added to the church, Acts 2, 47. Therefore, the saved are in the church, and whatever it takes to be saved from sin is exactly what it takes to become a member of the church. It happens at the same time. It happens at the same time. Acts 2.47 is important because 
a church cannot be right, it cannot be the church that Christ built if the terms of entrance into it are not what Christ gave. Such a body would not be the Lord's body or the Lord's church. What if a runner, for example, gets into a race and wins that race, but he didn't properly enter, he didn't meet the qualifications, he didn't register to run in the race, didn't pay the fee if there was a fee involved, and he wins the race. To whom would the victory go when that was discovered? Not to him. It would go to the next qualified runner. Christ, and not church creeds or formulas, Christ is the answer to sin. And faith in Christ is the pipeline through which we make the transition from sinner to saint. For by grace you have been saved through faith, Paul wrote in Ephesians 2, 8. Faith is the how. But at what point am I saved and added to the Lord's church? When am I saved by faith? The book of Acts is so important to this question about when a person is saved and when he's added to the church. Why is that? Because the church was not established until after the death of Christ. In Matthew 16, 18, upon this rock I will build future tense my church. The blood was not shed until the cross. And the book of Acts gives us several examples of the plan. Yes, the plan that was in use by the apostles. They left an inspired record for us. And what they taught people to do to be saved and to be added to the church was the same in all cases. The same in all cases. And incidentally, Philip, who went down to Samaria and preached Christ to them, Acts 8, 5, you go a few verses later to Acts 12, and you see those Samaritans, and here's what was said. Now, when they believed Philip as he preached, the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Go back to verse 5. Philip went down to Samaria and preached Christ to them. The denominational world will say amen to that clearly. Let's preach Christ. But in verse 12, we've learned more about what it involved to preach Christ. Now, when they believe Philip, when he what? As he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God. What's the kingdom of God as we've already established? It's the church. Philip taught them about the kingdom, about the church, and the name of Jesus Christ. And that, does that mean he just said the name of Christ over and over again? No. The name of Christ is what? His authority. He taught them about the church and about the authority of Christ, that Christ has all authority. And when they heard those things about the church and the authority of Christ, which would include so many things, including how to worship, etc., they were what? Baptized. And so in the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they heard about baptism. Otherwise, they would have never known to be baptized. Same principle is seen with the eunuch, isn't it? Acts 8.35, beginning at this scripture, Philip preached Christ to him, and then they came to a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? How did he learn about baptism? In the preaching of Christ. How did the Samaritans learn about the kingdom? In the preaching of Christ. How did they learn about baptism? In the preaching of Christ. You can't preach Christ without preaching baptism, and you can't preach Christ without preaching the church for which Jesus Christ shed his blood. So that plan involved belief, repentance, confession, and baptism, about which we'll speak more throughout this week. And so what we've seen to this point strongly emphasizes that a pattern existed in New Testament times for saving people and for adding them to the church. It was the same for all, and it's the only plan by which all must be saved and added to the church today. Where did the apostles get this plan? Where did they get this pattern? The Lord promised it to, him, to them in John chapter 14, verse 26, for example. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. John 16, 13, as a part of that same discourse that Jesus had with his apostles prior to his betrayal, 
However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you all things. Let me ask you, did all truth include only the plan for saving man and adding him to the Lord's church, or was there more involved? And that leads to the next important question. Did those who were added to the church when it was first established follow a specific pattern after they were saved? Did all truth include only the plan for saving man, or was there more? Acts 2.42, at which we looked earlier this morning, says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and the prayers. They, who are they? The church. The apostles' doctrine for the church was the same everywhere. Listen to 1 Corinthians 4, 17. For this reason I have sent Timothy to you, he wrote to the Corinthians, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere, in every church. As I teach everywhere in every church. He said I teach it the same way everywhere. 1 Corinthians 7, 17, same concept. But as God has distributed to each one, as the Lord has called each one, so let him walk, and so I ordain in all the churches. The apostles never instructed the church to use the pattern if they chose to, but if they didn't want to, they didn't have to. In fact, just the opposite was the case. The church was warned never to leave the apostles' doctrine, never to leave that pattern. Listen to a few verses. 1 Timothy 1 and verse 3. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus, writing to Timothy, that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine. That sounds very much like a pattern of doctrine, doesn't it? What about 2 Timothy 1.13? Again, writing to Timothy, hold the pattern. There he uses the word pattern. King James says form. New King James says pattern. Hold the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Hold the pattern. And what did John say about this pattern? Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. Some have tried to dodge that statement and the import of that statement from John by saying, well, that's not the doctrine that Christ taught. That's the doctrine about Christ. Well, certainly it would include the doctrine about Christ, but it also includes the doctrine that Christ taught and that he authorized and that he promised that the apostles would be led into all truth by the Holy Spirit. You can prove that by John 12, 48. He who rejects me, Jesus said, and does not receive my what? my words. The same will judge him in the last day. He who rejects me and does not receive my word, the same will judge him in the last day. The word that I have spoken, I have authorized. The apostles never placed their word above those of Christ. What they claimed was that their word was the word of Christ. It was the same. In that same prayer in John 17, in the portion of that prayer for which he prayed for the apostles, he said, For I have given to them the words which you have given me. The words. Now our final question quickly. Were the first Christians united in one church? Or were they scattered throughout various denominations? What if you on that Pentecost day were to walk up to someone who had been baptized into Christ and said, by the way, I'm interested to know what denomination you uh, have joined since you were baptized. How would that person respond? The person would say, what is denomination? What do you mean by that? I don't know anything about denomination. I, I have been added to the church, the kingdom. I know nothing about denominationalism. They were united in one spiritual body. No denominations exist. They worshiped and worked together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Division did not rear its sinful head until some time after the church was established. And in the lesson about which we talk about the beginning of some of these various denominations, 
we'll talk then more in more detail about those divisions. They were predicted by Paul in 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 5, and again in 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 4. And some in the early church did depart from the doctrine of Christ. And some have done it even in the 21st century, tragically. Doctrine does matter. Many have been guilty of binding their traditions on others. The rise of the papacy, faith only, human names in organizations, and countless other departures from truth have overthrown the faith of many. What's my responsibility as a Christian in all of this? My responsibility is to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but to reprove them. I must do it in love. I must do it with patience. But I cannot have fellowship with any religious group that has left the pattern of New Testament Christianity. The Church of Christ follows the New Testament pattern of salvation, which means you must believe, repent of your sins, confess Christ, and be baptized to reach the blood of Christ and to be added to His church. The Church of Christ follows the New Testament pattern of Christian living, that is, binding only what Christ and the apostles and the inspired writers of the New Testament bound in the New Testament. And the Church of Christ follows the New Testament pattern of unity, worshiping as the New Testament teaches and having no fellowship with those who teach and practice error. It's our fervent prayer that if you're not a member of the Lord's Church, the pre-denominational body of Christ, that the things about which we've spoken concerning that blessed body tonight will encourage you to become a part of it in the only way you can, obeying the gospel of Christ and allowing the Lord to add you to that body in the only way you can, as we've just outlined it in that beautiful, but very simple and absolutely essential plan of salvation. If as a wayward child, you need to come home to your first love in repentance and prayer and allow us to pray with you and for you, we encourage you to come now as we stand, as we sing.